Good morning, and welcome to the celebration of Mass at St. Joseph the Workers, CBC Chapel of Choice. Please stand. We welcome visitors from other parishes who are with us today and those of another faith. We hope that our time together is worthwhile and welcoming and prayerful. Because the worship of God is so sacred, we ask that you turn off your cell phones and please do not text during Mass or leave the Lord's sacrifice before the closing hymn. In accordance with coronavirus guidelines, the collection basket will not be passed. Please place your offerings in the baskets at the back of the church. The Eucharistic ministers will bring communion to you at your seat, and we ask that you please take communion in your hand. Daily Mass is Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, and Friday at 11.15. There can be no gathering in groups before or after Mass, but please look around the church. If you know someone who is missing from the congregation, please reach out to them. When writing a check for your offering, please make checks payable to CBC Memorial Chapel. Congratulations to all who are celebrating a birthday or anniversary. To prepare ourselves to worship God, to sanctify our lives, and to build up the body of Christ, please let us now observe a moment of sacred silence. With one other note, if anyone is in need of First Communion, Confirmation, or RCIA, please see Father Patty or Amanda after. Lord, have mercy. May Almighty God have mercy on us. Forgive us our sins. 
and bring us to everlasting life. Amen. Please sing with the choir.
A reading from the letter of St. Paul to the Romans. Brothers and sisters, none of us lives for oneself, and no one dies for oneself. For if we live, we live for the Lord. But if we die, we die for the Lord. So then, whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. For this is why Christ died and came to life, that he might be the Lord of both the dead and the living. The word of the Lord.
come to their senses and to repent of their ways. So that's the context in which this reading occurs. And so we have Peter, who's always wonderful because he's just so human. And he's heard these words from Jesus. And so he says, well, how often should I give? Seven times? And there's Peter thinking, that's pretty, that's pretty benevolent of me to be willing to forgive seven times over. Jesus calls his bluff and says, no, I say 77 times. And actually, if you look at some of the translations, it's 70 times seven times, or 490 times. So again, just driving on that point of always be forgiving. But you know, whenever we see or hear numbers in, in scripture, we should always think about what do those numbers mean. And so, in looking at this, when we hear the number seven, it may recall to us from Genesis, when Cain was banished by God, and Cain was concerned about, about retribution, and God said whoever harms Cain would receive vengeance sevenfold. So there's Peter recalling that seven times forgiveness, seven times for, for Cain. And then in the book of Daniel, we have 490 years, which would be the time from the exile to the expiation of Israel. So these numbers have meaning, these numbers have context. And so that's what Jesus is bringing in to this discussion about forgiveness. But then he goes on to, to the parable. And it says that the servant owed a huge sum. Now there's, there's different translations, and the one that I like actually says that he owed 10,000 talents. Well, what's a talent? Well, in those days, a talent was a gold coin that was worth 6,000 denarii. So what's a denarii? Well, a denarius was one day's wages. So this servant owed his master 60 million denarii. 60 million days wages. Put that in terms of years. He was, a hundred, he was over 164,000 years in debt to this, to this master. And I think that gives us a little bit of insight into the debt we owe God. I mean, it is massive. It is unbelievable and it is beyond our capabilities. If we lived 200,000 years, we would never be able to pay our debt to God. And of course, God knows that, which is why he sent his only son to pay a debt that we never could. And so we have the master who is compassionate and kind, and he forgives his debt. And one would think, that this servant would be overjoyed to have this burden taken off of him. And yet, what do we see? He encounters one of his fellow servants and demands payment on a much smaller debt. Some places it's, it's termed 100 denarii, 100 days wages. Think of that. He has just been forgiven 164 plus thousand years of debt. Yet, he cannot find the compassion to forgive a hundred days. And so he has his servant, fellow servant thrown into prison. And you see, back in those days, that's what prison was about. Prison was for debtors. Now, if you committed a capital crime, they took care of that pretty quickly. There wasn't a long incarceration before they passed sentence and judgment on that. But back in those days, you remained in debtor's prison until family or friends or benevolent benefactor came up with the money to pay off your debt and get you out. And so that's, what, that's what's driving this parable. But you know, if we go and we look back at our earlier readings, we see some of the basis of what Jesus is talking about. In the book of Sirach, the book of Sirach is also known as the Clasticus, which means the book of the church. And early on, these readings were very popular in the early church because there was so much teaching associated with these readings. 
And so if we look at the reading from Sirach today, we see where it says, the vengeful will suffer the Lord's vengeance. And so what does that teach us? It teaches us that it is God's, God's right to judge. It's God's right to pass sentence. It's God's right to punishment, not ours. Ours is to forgive. And it talks about forgiving our neighbor's injustice for the simple reason that if we do, if we forgive others, then our own sins will be forgiven. And then it talks about harboring anger power and resentment and having an expectation of mercy. And we can't, we can't receive what we don't have. If we don't give mercy, we can't expect mercy. And then of course Sirach reminds us that our day of judgment is coming when he says, remember your last days. See, we will be judged. We will be judged in a, related to the mercy that we're willing to give. And our psalms also give us some insight. The psalm tells us how we are to imitate God. And what is God? God is kind, merciful, slow to anger, rich in compassion. And we hear that he pardons all of our inequities. And so we are called to pardon the inequities of our brothers and sisters. And he talks about putting our transgressions apart as far as east is from west. You see, when God forgives, he has the ability to forget. He has the ability to put it far away. Now, unfortunately for us, as human beings, we don't have that capacity. We don't have the capacity to really forgive and forget. We may forgive, but we rarely forget. And as I was looking through some readings on this, I found a reading from Pope Francis. He had an uh, encyclical called Misericorde Valtus, which is the face of mercy. And it talks about this parable. And it talks about how we, as Christians, are to approach and understand this parable. And he says, this parable contains profound teaching for all of us. Jesus affirms that mercy is not only an action of the Father, it becomes a criterion for ascertaining who his children, true children are. In short, we are called to show mercy because mercy has first been shown to us. Pardoning offenses becomes the clearest expression of merciful love. And for us Christians, it is an imperative from which we cannot excuse ourselves. At times, how hard it seems to forgive, yet pardon is the instrument placed into our fragile hands to attain serenity of heart, to let go of anger, wrath, violence, and revenge are necessary conditions to living joyfully. Let me say that again. To let go of anger, wrath, violence, revenge are necessary conditions to living joyfully. And also from the Catechism, paragraph 2843, which also refers to this parable, it says the parable of the merciless servant, which crowns the Lord's teaching on ecclesial communion, ends with these words. So also my heavenly Father will do to every one of you, if you do not forgive your brother from your heart, it is there, in fact, in the depths of the heart, that everything is bound and loose. It is not in our power not to feel or to forget an offense, but the heart that offers itself to the Holy Spirit turns injury into compassion and purifies the memory in transforming the hurt into intercession. So what can we do? We're fallen human beings. We can't remove feelings of hurt and anger. We can't forget transgressions against us. So what can we do to those who have hurt us? We can pray for them. We can pray that God bless us. We can pray 
that God heals them. We can pray that God saves them. You see, to will the good of another is the definition of love. And so my brothers and sisters, this is the merciful love that Jesus Christ is calling us to do. Please stand now as we profess our faith. Sacrifice for us were made strong, 
And as we drink his blood that was poured out for us, we are washed clean. And so with the angels and archangels, with drones and dominions, and with all the hosts and powers of heaven, we sing the hymn of your glory, as without end we acclaim. Let us pray for Mr. Leonard and all the sick as we pray the prayer of Jesus' name. 
Deliver us, Lord, we pray from every evil. Graciously grant peace in our days, that by the help of your mercy, we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress, as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Lord Jesus Christ, who said to your apostles, Peace I leave you, my peace I give you. Look not on our sins, but on the faith of your church, and graciously grant your peace and unity in accordance with your will, who live and reign forever and ever. Peace of the Lord be with you always. And with you. Let's offer each other a sign of peace.
May the working of this heavenly gift, O Lord, we pray, take possession of our minds and bodies, so that its effects, and not our own desires, may always prevail in us, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Got a cute email here about buying a car. A retired old couple returned to a Corvette dealership where the salesman had just sold the car they had been interested in to a beautiful leggy, busty blonde in a miniskirt and a halter top. The old man was visibly upset. He spoke to the salesman sharply. Young man, I thought you said you would hold that car till we raise the 85,000 asking price. Yet I just overheard you close the deal for 72,000 to a lovely young lady there. And if I remember right, you had insisted there was no way you could discount this model. The salesman took a deep breath, cleared his throat and reached for a glass of water. Well, what can I tell you? She had the cash ready, didn't need any financial help. And sir, look at her. How could I resist? I replied the grinning salesman sleepishly. Just then, the young woman approached the senior couple and gave the car keys to the old man. There you go, she said. I told you I could get that idiot to lower the price. See you later, Dad. Happy Father's Day. Once again, God bless for all folks. I bet you didn't expect it in that way. Lovely to see everybody at Mass this morning and keep spreading the word. Please encourage people to come and if anybody needs us to bring communion to them, please let me know and Amy is willing to bring communion as well to anybody that needs it. So uh, we, we want to take care of our people, especially those that are afraid to come. And uh, be safe from the hurricane. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. And the Almighty God bless you. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Master then, go in peace. Thanks be to God.